Pravit Moy Druzi. Hello, my friends. My name is Darren Gertis. I'm a professor that tries to help you understand what's going on in Ukraine to give you some context. Today, we're going to talk about Russophobia. What is Russophobia and how does it work? So if you just Google it, you'll find that it is a strong dislike toward Russia and Russian things, especially the political system or customs of the former Soviet Union. But it's much more than that because the Russians have used Russophobia as something more, as a pretext for actually invading Ukraine. Uh, the fear, hostility, or prejudice toward Russia or Russians. Oh, they're prejudiced. They're against us. They're going to oppress these Russians or whatever it is. Okay, so here we're going to look at RT. This is an article by Scott Ritter. Now I'm going to address Scott Ritter in another video because he needs to be addressed. Scott Ritter, a former U.S. Marine, uh, and uh, Colonel McGregor are probably the two leading pro-Russian commentators, and you'll find them come up again and again in RT. Well, he talks about Russophobia here. Uh, he talked about uh, a, a article posted on the Russian Embassy Facebook page, Russophobia as a Malignant Tumor in the United States. And he said, and the article actually said, with a straight face, Russia has always venerated and respected the rich cultural traditions of all countries. Mm, I, I don't think so, because uh, when I look at the Smithsonian page, I see this, how Ukrainians are defending their cultural heritage from Russian destruction. I'm not sure that they were actually looking for Nazis in this building, which is another pretext that they're not there. Uh, I think actually instead of Russophobia, the Ukrainians would have a strong argument to say that there is Ukrainophobia. There is a phobia of Ukrainian cultural heritage and the Russians are destroying that and intentionally destroying that. Here's the actual Facebook page. Here's the line. Russia has always venerated and respected the rich cultural traditions of all countries. This is the core of our national identity, mentality, and statehood. Culture must always remain the bridge for strengthening trust between the peoples, however complicated the relations between the states may be. So it can't possibly be true what they're saying. Okay, the United Nations had a meeting here recently where Russophobia, a term used to justify Moscow's war crimes in Ukraine, a historian tells the Security Council. And I'm going to show you the video of that. A number of you have sent that to me and said, hey, what do you think of this? And it was really, really powerful. But before I do, I want to show you some polls so that you understand what he's saying. This is Tim Snyder, who I'm going to show you in just a moment. You understand that what Tim Snyder is actually saying is legitimate. So here's some polling, and I'm going to show you legitimate polls. Here's Pew Research. If you find any polls from Pew Research, Gallup, um, the Levada Center, uh, the uh, Kiev Institute for Sociology, uh, Institute for Sociology, or um, Quinnipiac, those are very strong polling organizations that you can pretty much rely on. Okay, so here's International Attitudes. This is June 22nd, 2022. So shortly after the invasion, International Attitudes toward the U.S., NATO, and Russia in a time of crisis. So uh, the U.S. has about a 2 to 1 favorable to unfavorable rating. NATO has a little bit stronger than 2 to 1 favorable to unfavorable rating. Russia has a 10 to 85 it's 8.5 to 1 negative view from the rest of the world. Here's Biden has a little bit uh, less than 2 to 1, almost 2 to 1 radio rating. And Putin has a 10 to 1 negative of va view, favorable to unfavorable. Now, is that Russophobia? No, it's not Russophobia. Here's why. If you go back into the polls and you see what's going on, uh, the, within Ukraine, this is the uh, Kiev Institute for uh, International Institute for Sociology. You go back and look at the polling. They in Ukraine they had a almost ninety percent favorable uh, view of Russia in April of 08 to about ten, and then something changed in eleven, and it went down to about 85, 80 percent, and then by thirteen fourteen, Maidan revolution, seizing Crimea entering the Donbass, it was at a low ebb in 15, okay? So this is this is the bad evaluation, this is good. I'm just going to track good here, just for clarity, for consistency. And it went up a little bit, and by 19, it was almost a 50%, or it's over 50%. And then it came back down again with Russian action. So it's not just Russophobia, where we just don't like these Russians. No, they, they generally liked the Russians for a long time, until they did stuff. And then they liked them until they did stuff. And this is February 22, before the invasion. And about that time, you got this 
This is the same organization, uh, and this was February 14th to 22nd, 2023, one year into the war. What do uh, Ukrainians believe about launching strikes into Russian territory? 90% support strikes of some, some sort of strikes, sometimes only military infrastructure, but some are, including population, supporting strikes into the Russian population. Now that changed. Again, it was 90% favorable in 2008, and now 90% support strikes into the Russian territory. Well, in the year of all-out aggression against Ukraine, something changed. Here's the same poll. Now, this is only a couple months into the war. And look at the difference between 90% favorable to 2% favorable just two months into the war, as opposed to 92% unfavorable. I mean, it's just, it's absolutely amazing what happened. So it's not russophobia. It's actions cause consequence. That's what's happened. So Let's look at what Tim Snyder has to say. Now, if you don't know who Timothy Snyder is, he's an historian at Yale who studies um, this region of the world. He has a series on Ukraine on YouTube, and I'll link it at the end. But here's what he had to say when the Russians decided that they thought it was a good idea to invoke the United Nations to discuss Russophobia. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very glad to be with you. I will try to keep my remarks brief. I speak to you as a historian of the region, a historian of Eastern Europe, and specifically as a historian of mass killing and political atrocity. I believe that the discussion that we're having today about this word, Russophobia, can clarify something, something very important about the character of Russia's war of aggression in Ukraine and about the character of Russia's illegal occupation of Ukrainian territory. I will limit myself to two main points. My first point is that harm to Russians and harm to Russian culture is primarily a matter of Russian policy. Yep, that's exactly right. Like, look back at the poll and see what the polls actually had to say. Look back at how Russian policy was fine and then Russian policy was to invade, right? Or let's let's be generous to the Russians' position. There was a, pre, a Ukrainian president who was uh, about to join uh, a, a European Union thing and he was persuaded over to join the Russians. The Maidan revolution happened here and then you, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine and took Crimea and Donbass. That's what actually has happened. So there was actions that caused this. There was a chain of events here. Okay. And so that if, so that if we're concerned about harm to Russians and Russian culture, we should be concerned about the policies of the Russian state. That's exactly right, because they cause the very thing that they're worried about right now and saying, oh, you're being bad. Really? My second point will be that the term Russophobia, which we are discussing today, has been during this war a form of imperial propaganda, mm -hmm. a has. form of imperial justification for Russian war crimes in Ukraine. So, beginning from the first point, the premise when we discuss Russophobia is that we are concerned about harm to Russians. That is a premise that I certainly share. I share the concern for Russians. I share the concern for Russian culture. Let us think then of the actions this last year which have caused the most harm to Russians and to Russian culture. Was it Ukrainians that caused it, or was it what Russians actually did to themselves? I'll briefly name 10. Number one, forcing the most creative and productive Russians to emigrate. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has caused about 750,000 Russians to leave Russia, including some of the most creative and productive people. And some of the estimates have gone as high as a million or more than a million. He's being conservative as a good professor should. This is irreparable harm to Russian culture. Number two, 
the destruction of independent Russian journalism so that Russians cannot know the world around them. This too is Russian policy and causes irreparable harm to Russian culture. So independent news media in Russia has largely been chased out. You have state media that's pulling the party line. But if you say war as opposed to special military operation, you can go to jail for years. Facebook's been banned. YouTube's been banned. So this is a pretty terrible state of events. Number three, general censorship and repression of freedom of speech in Russia, mm -hmm. in the Russian language. And this is an irony which bears noting. In Ukraine, you can say what you like in either Russian or Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. In Russia, you cannot. If you stand in Russia with a sign saying no to war, you will be arrested and very likely imprisoned. If you stand in, in Ukraine with a sign that says no to war, regardless of what language it's, it's in, nothing will happen to you. Russia is a country where there's one language and you can say very little. Ukraine is a country where there are two languages and you can say where you, what you like. When I visit Ukraine, people report to me about Russian war crimes using both languages, using Ukrainian or using Russian as they prefer. Number four. So I want to stop there for a second because that's a very powerful distinction between what's actually happened in lockdown Russia that's become more authoritarian and Ukraine where freedom still prevails even in the space of the war. The attack on Russian culture by way of censoring school books, weakening Russian culture at home, the destruction of museums and non-governmental organizations devoted to the memory of Russian history. All of those things are Russian policy. Number five, the perversion of the memory of the Great Fatherland War by fighting a war of aggression in 2014 and 2022, thereby depriving all future generations of Russians of that heritage. That is Russian policy. It's great harm to Russian culture. And I would also add the conflation of Nazis with whatever they think Nazis are right now, like real Nazis in Germany in 1940s. That's a big difference from whatever you're saying as a boogeyman. There are Nazis there. Show us the Nazis. Anybody, by the way, I challenge you, if you're Russian and you're watching this, show me who are the Nazis in Ukraine. I defy you to do that. I don't mean show me somebody wearing a symbol that you say is somehow Nazi related. I mean, show me who's an actual Nazi. If you can do it, I'd be very interested in seeing what you have, but you can't do it. Number six the downgrading of Russian culture around the world, and the end of what used to be called the Ruski Mir. The okay, and I just showed you on the map, 2% support in Ukraine. Putin is at 9 to 90, favorable to unfavorable in the polls. I'm not making this up. Russian world abroad. It used to be the case that there were many people who felt friendly to Russia and the Russian culture in Ukraine. That has been brought to an end by Russian invasion, mm -hmm. and that is Russian policy. Number seven, the mass killing of Russian speakers in Ukraine. The Russian war of aggression in Ukraine has killed more speakers of Russian than any other action by far. There's no. And here he's just talking about Ukrainians that speak Russian, who the Russians are saying they're trying to protect. They're not trying to protect. It's genocide. It's cultural and actual genocide. No comparison. And of course, number eight, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has led to the mass killing of Russian citizens. Some 200,000 are dead or maimed. Right. And this is, of course, simply Russian policy. It's Russian policy to send young Russians to die. But only because Putin sent them across the border to fight people who were not threatening them. The Ukrainians were not saying, we're about to invade Russia. That wasn't happening at all. I in a war of aggression. Number nine... This war also means that a generation of young Russians, those who survive, will be involved in war crimes, will be wrapped up in trauma and guilt for the rest of their lives. That is great harm to Russian culture, and that has been achieved, like all of these policies, by the Russian government itself, mostly in the course of the last year. Yep. So if we were sincerely concerned about harm to Russians, these are the things that we would think about. But perhaps the worst Russian policy with respect to Russians is the last one, number 10, 
And that is the sustained training or education of Russians that genocide is normal. Hmm. We see this in the president of Russia's repeated claims that Ukraine does not exist. We see this in genocidal fantasies on Russian state media. We see this in a year of state television reaching millions, tens of millions of the Russian population. So let me pause here for a second because this is an important point. This this idea that uh, that the humanizes Ukrainians makes them less than valuable compared to Russians. Uh, you see it everywhere. You see it on, on RT. And I watch RT fairly regularly to try to understand that side. You don't have to. I understand it, it, it raises my blood pressure, but I'm trying to interpret what's going on. If you don't want to do that, watch Jake Bro, B R O E. Watch Jake Bro. He will highlight these in his videos very regularly. But you can see it again and again, and he'll talk about it some. Every day. We see this when Russian state television presents Ukrainians as pigs. We see this when Russian state television presents Ukrainians as parasites. Mm -hmm. We see this when Russian state television presents Ukrainians as worms. We see this when Russian state television presents Ukrainians as Satanists or as ghouls. We see this when Russian state television proclaims that Ukrainian children should be drowned. We see this when Russian state television proclaims that Ukrainian houses should be burned with the people inside. We see this when people appear on Russian state television and say, quote, they should not exist at all. We should execute them by firing squad. Does this we sound, see this when someone appears on Russian state television. Does this sound like Russophobia or does this sound like Ukrainophobia? to my earlier point? It sounds like the Russians have a terrible fear of Ukraine. And says... We will kill one million. We will kill five million. We can exterminate all of you, meaning all of the Ukrainians. Now, if we were sincerely concerned about harms to Russians, we would be concerned about what Russian policy is doing to Russians. Yep. The claim that Ukrainians are, quote unquote, Russophobes is one more element of Russian hate speech. In Russian state television, those other claims about Ukrainians are intermixed with the claim that U Ukrainians are Russophobes. So, for example... So it justifies what Russia is doing. Oh, because they're this, we can do that to them. No, this is the aggressor blaming the victim. In the statement where the speaker claimed that all Ukrainians should be exterminated, the reason he gave is that they should all be exterminated because... They are Russophobes. This brings me to my second point. The claim that Ukrainians have to be killed because they have a mental illness known as Russophobia is bad for Russians mm -hmm. because it educates them in genocide. It does. But of course, such a claim is much worse for Ukrainians. And this is my second point. The term Russophobia is a rhetorical strategy that we know from the history of imperialism. When an empire attacks, the empire claims that it is the victim. The rhetoric that Ukrainians are somehow Russophobes is used by the Russian state to justify a war of aggression. And I heard this a lot early on, specifically, well, the Russians had to do something because NATO was encroaching on their border. Every country that joined NATO joined NATO voluntarily. Every country that joined the Warsaw Pact was enfolded into the Warsaw Pact against their will. Look at the difference between that. This was a war of aggression, and it's used to Russophobia is used to justify this continued aggression. But of course, it's the war of aggression. It's the setting that matters. The invasion itself the destruction of whole Ukrainian cities, the execution of Ukrainian local leaders, the forced deportation of Ukrainian children, the displacement of about half the Ukrainian population, the destruction of hundreds of hospitals and thousands of schools, deliberate targeting of water and heat supplies during the winter. That is the setting. That is what is actually happening. The term Russophobia is a claim by the imperial power that it is the victim, even as it is carrying out a war of atrocity. 
Again, it's blaming the victim. The aggressor is using this to blame the victim where they're actually doing the opposite. I've said this again. What Russian propaganda does is what it, whatever it's saying about America or Ukraine or NATO, it's actually doing itself. This is historically typical behavior. The imperial power dehumanizes the mm -hmm. actual victim That's right. and claims to be the victim. When the victim opposes being attacked, being murdered, being colonized, the empire says that this is unreasonable, this is an illness, this is a phobia. This claim that the victims are irrational, that they are phobic, that they have a phobia, is meant to distract from the actual experience of the victims in the real world, which is an experience, of course, of aggression and war and atrocity. This setting where he's talking is in the United Nations Security Council in order to to address the issue of Russophobia. This meeting is a distraction from what's actually happening in Ukraine. It's saying, see, Russians are being persecuted by this Russophobia. What about the 40,500 uh, or more bombs by this point in the war that have fallen on Ukraine? The term Russophobia is imperial strategy designed to change the subject from an actual war of aggression to the feelings of the aggressors, thereby right. suppressing the existence and the experience of the people who are most harmed. Right. The imperialist says, we are the only people here. We are the real victims and our hurt feelings count more than other people's lives. Let that sink in, that Russian feelings count more than Ukrainian lives. I think they actually believe that. I mean, I think they really are more concerned with their own feelings than with Ukrainian lives. Now, Russia's crimes can be and will be evaluated by Ukrainian law because they take place on Ukrainian territory and by international law. And I have said this before, Putin shouldn't stand trial in The Hague. I don't want him to stand trial in The Hague. I want him to stand trial in Kiev, on the ground where his horrible war crimes have taken place. To the naked eye, we can see that there is a war of aggression, crimes of humanity, and genocide. The use of the word Russophobia, the claim that Ukrainians are ill rather than that they are experiencing an atrocity, is colonial rhetoric, and it's a part of a larger practice of hate speech. That is why this session is important. In Russia's genocidal hate speech, the idea that Ukrainians have a disease called Russophobia is used as an argument to destroy them, along with the arguments that they are vermin, parasites, Satanists, and so on. Claiming to be the victim when you, are, when you are in fact the aggressor is not part of the defense. It's actually part of the crime. Wow, just get, let that sink in. This isn't part of their defense. This is showing that this is evidence of their crime. Hate speech directed against Ukrainians is not part of the defense of the Russian Federation. It's part of the crimes that Russian citizens are committing on Ukrainian territory. In this sense, in calling this session, the Russian state has found a new way to confess to war crimes. Thank you for your attention. That was powerful. I mean, that was amazingly powerful. If you want to understand more about uh, Timothy Snyder, Timothy Snyder is a Yale professor who has uh, done an entire series on Ukraine. I will link that up here and you can watch that. And I, I would highly recommend that you do. Um, so thank you for taking that time to hear all that and digest it. I know it's pretty heavy. There's a lot to understand there, but um, Russophobia, I think, is a fiction that the aggressors use to justify what they're doing, where Ukrainophobia probably is a legitimate term. And that's what's happening right now. Thank you for your time and thank you for being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine.